thank you for coming to Porkfest, Porkfest 2015, the 12th annual Porcupine Freedom Festival. So our next next speaker is Jacob Hornberger, who's the president of the Future of Freedom Foundation. So please welcome Jacob Hornberger to the stage. All right, thanks guys. Uh, you know, this is my first trip to Pork Fest. Here, been, been here, yeah, yeah. Been hearing lots of good things about this uh, event over the years and uh, finally said, hey, I gotta test this out. But, you know, before I came, somebody warned me that this was kind of a dangerous event. And I said, well, what's so dangerous about it? And he says, man, Pork Fest is filled with anarchists. I said, wow, oh no, I'm not sure I want to come, you know. But here I am braving the, braving the, the, the crowd, including the anarchists. It's great to be here. You know, uh, I think that one of the biggest challenges that we face in America as libertarians is the fact that all too many non-libertarians think they're free. I mean, they honestly believe they live in a free society. You see that when you go to ball games, for example, where you stand up in the fourth inning and praise the troops and take your cap off and, and thank God I'm an American because at least I know I'm free. And, and when you look at their faces, you really, you really are convinced that they're convinced that they live in a free country. And I think the American people perfectly embody one of the best quotes that I've ever heard. And it, it's the quote by Johann Goethe that says, none are more hopelessly enslaved than those who falsely believe they are free. And so the real question is, how do, how do we break through that, that, that obstacle? You know, I'm, I'm one of those that believes that we have the potential of achieving the free society now. I, I know there's people that say, oh, the state's too big, the government's too powerful. Uh, I want, one of my favorite is, oh, we gotta put our faith in the young people. Oh, we gotta work on the young people. Uh, you know, as if, you know, free, freedom is going to be a long time away, and so we got to invest in the young. Hey, when I was in my 20s, when I achieved my breakthrough to libertarianism, that's what the old people were saying about us. <laughs> saying, hey, we're going to invest in you young people. Okay, well, we're now the old people, and what are we going to do, keep repeating this cycle? We're like the people in their 20s today, 40 years from now, are they going to be in their 60s and Oh, we've got to invest in the young people, you know. Well, I think this is all just a big cop-out. It's a cop-out by many libertarians that says freedom is just too difficult and I'm just going to just give up the ghost. I'm just going to forget trying to achieve freedom and I'm going to just start backing reform. I'm going to accept the premises of the welfare warfare state and I'm going to work to make it better. And even worse, some of them start thinking in terms of that they're advancing freedom while they're doing this. I mean, let's start with a basic moral principle, a principle that is central to libertarianism. Don't take what doesn't belong to you. We all learn that as kids. It's wrong to take what doesn't belong to you. In a religious sense, thou shalt not steal. Basic principle, and we all know it. If I come and accost you in a dark alley and I take all your money, I'm a thief. Oh, but what if I use your money to go help the poor? What if I don't even use any of it for myself? I go help somebody get an education or I help somebody get an operation that his mother needs or something. Does that make me a good person? Of course not. Every single person would say, Jacob, you remain a thief. Use your own money if you want to be good. Voluntarily get money from people, but don't go and steal somebody's money to do good. But the big blind spot comes with our non-libertarian friends, those that have not yet achieved a breakthrough like we have, comes with respect to government, that when the majority votes to take somebody's money and gives it to somebody else, all of a sudden the whole society is converted into compassionate, uh, Christian, religious, you know, loving people. When really, in a moral sense, what's the difference? And you know, the, the crown jewel of this system, of what we call the welfare state, it's a way of life where the role of government exists to take money from one group of people in order to give it to another group. And what's the crown jewel of the welfare state? 
Social Security. I mean, th this, is the, this is the big deal of, of, the, of the welfare state. You know, that where you, you take money from the young and the productive and you give it to the seniors. Now, there's a lot of self-deception that goes into this thing, you know. You got a lot of seniors saying, oh, no, 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 this is my money. I'm getting my money back. Uh, uh, it's in a pool. It's, it's in a fund. I put my money in. I have a right to give it, get it back. It's just a lie. It, and it's a self-induced lie. There is no fund. There never has been a fund. Nobody puts their money into anything. You get taxed. That's the basis. You get taxed, whether it's an income tax or a FICA tax or a sales tax. The government's taking your money to give it to other people. And the old people that, that did it to us when we were in our 20s and 30s and 40s, they're dead. Okay, so now it's our generation that's there taking money from the young and the productive. It's a straight transfer program. Confiscate transfer. A violation of that basic principle, don't take what doesn't belong to you. And yet you have libertarians. Well, of course, you have conservatives that wouldn't dare call for the repeal of Social Security. But ironically, you have a lot of libertarians, including libertarian organizations, that can't bring themselves to call for the repeal of this program, the immediate repeal of this program. Now, notice I'm not saying reform the program. I'm not saying gradually phase it out. I'm saying the immediate repeal. Now, some people say, Jacob, well, there's no magic button. You can't just push a button to repeal it. But we learned, as we learned just recently with the Patriot Act, you can repeal laws. Now, granted, that it didn't last long. They passed the so-called USA Freedom Act. <laughs> Who comes up with these names? Uh, but the fact is, the Patriot Act was repealed. Any law can be repealed. And Social Security is like any other law. It can be repealed today. And it should be repealed today. It goes out of existence. And yet you have libertarians that can't bring themselves to say that. Why? Well, they're scared of adverse reaction. Oh, well, what will people think about me if I, if I, if I dare call for the repeal of Social Security? And oh my gosh, it's, it's, it's heartless to take the people off the dole who have become dependent on the dole. I mean, imagine a guy that's like 90 years old and that's caught embezzling from a business. And, he, and he's caught and he says, well, look, I've been dependent on this. I've been doing this embezzling for 30 years. And so you can imagine some libertarians saying, oh, that poor guy has become dependent on it. We've got to let him keep embezzling money from that business. Ridiculous, right? Yeah, if you want to help that guy, help him yourself. Don't let him keep embezzling from the other the business. But that's what is going on with Social Security. You, you have plans now where, where, of course, conservatives do it, but where libertarians also call for reform plans that consist of, okay, the seniors will continue to receive their dole, and, but we're going to modify it so everybody 40 and under, say, they have to put their money into a government-approved retirement account. What? And they call this libertarian-oriented, or freedom-oriented, or choice, or private, Social Security privatization. That's one of my favorites. It's really just nothing but a fascist plan. I mean, this is what economic fascism is about. Leaving private property in private hands, but putting it subject to government control. And so now, is that better than, is fascism better than socialism? Well, maybe, maybe not. I mean, they've been fighting over that for eons, fascists and socialists. But what does that have to do with liberty? I mean, liberty is a way of life where you're free to keep everything you earn and decide for yourself what to do with it. And if you don't want to do your retirement, you don't want to save for your retirement, that's what freedom's all about. It's the right to engage in any conduct you want, make any choices you want. No matter how irresponsible, no matter how dangerous, no matter how self-destructive, no matter how immoral, as long as your conduct is peaceful. And so, obviously, the only solution to Social Security is repeal it, repeal the taxes it funded, repeal all income taxes, and leave people free to keep everything they have and, and decide for themselves what to do with it, including charitable decisions. So we would separate charity in the state. We would separate income in the state. 
We would separate economy and the state, just as our ancestors separated church and state. You see the same phenomenon with, with health care. You know, the conservatives spend all their time, oh, repeal Obamacare, repeal Obamacare, repeal Obamacare. Even some uh, libertarians have jumped on that bandwagon. But you see, there was a crisis that led up to Obamacare. Conservatives forget about that. Now, how do you deal with that crisis that existed? Well, they say, oh, we're going to have mandatory retirement, I mean, health care accounts, like IRAs, health care IRAs, where people have to put their money into these retirement accounts. Notice, notice the operative word there, mandate, force, coercion. And they call that freedom-oriented. They call it privatization. They call it choice. It's ridiculous. The, the crisis that led up to Obamacare was rooted in Medicare and Medicaid. Given that that's the case, there's only one solution to that. Repeal Medicare, repeal Medicaid, repeal all the reforms that came into existence because of the crises that Medicare and Medicaid induced, and again, leave people free to manage their own lives, their own money, keep everything they earn, and handle their own health care decisions. It's the only cons thing consistent with a free society. And yet you have libertarians calling for things that are really the antithesis of a free society thinking that this is the way to achieve freedom. That we're going to achieve freedom by advancing programs that are anti-freedom. And ask yourself, a person that hasn't achieved the same breakthrough as we have, what are the chances that that person is going to achieve the breakthrough by hearing some kind of reform proposal? I mean, put yourself back, say, in the 1800s. You know, you're in the midst of uh, slavery, 1850. And, and people come to you and say, hey, got an idea. Let's make life better on the plantation for the slaves. Slavery is just really horrible, and let's, let's do this. No more lashing on the plantation. Uh, Eight-hour work week for the slaves. Uh, choice. They get a voucher. A vo each slave gets a voucher to choose the plantation of his choice. And you say, wow, this is great, man. This is, you know, a free market approach to slavery. You know? <laughs> But, you know, there, there's one big problem with this. You, do you see the problem? See, it's not freedom. It's slavery. Maybe better form of slavery. And that's what's going on with all these reform plans that libertarians are proposing. A better form of serfdom, but it's not freedom. And even worse, it's worse than that. Because what they do by adopting these reform plans is they convey the message to non-libertarians that the state has a legitimate role in these areas. The state has a legitimate role managing health care, social security, retirement. Let's take another one like uh, immigration. I mean, I, I've seen libertarians say, I'm not going to take a position on libertarian, it's too on oh, immigration, too divisive, too divisive. What? I mean, here you have a classic example of the libertarian non-aggression principle that people should be free to do whatever they want as long as their conduct is peaceful. That includes crossing borders in search of, of work, in search of associating with people they want to associate with. It's called freedom of association. Or entering into mutually beneficial transactions with American employers called liberty of contract. Or if you want to put it in Jefferson's terms in the Declaration of Independence, the right to pursue happiness. A right that doesn't just adhere to Americans, but to all people. So you, you couldn't find a better violation of the libertarian non-aggression principle than immigration controls. And yet you have libertarians that are scared to death to call for open immigration and open borders and free trade because they'll get an adverse reaction from people. Oh my gosh, people will attack me. Well, so what? Because, you see, the only way people are ever going to consider libertarianism is they've got to hear what libertarianism is. And, and if you settle for some kind of reform, and, and let me give you the best example of the immigration reform concept, that you, know, that you have libertarians saying, I favor increased levels of immigration. Okay, see, they, now they believe in open borders, and I've talked to these libertarians. On a private side, they'll say, I favor open immigration, but I can't say that publicly in front of an audience. I mean, my gosh, you know, I don't want to lose the audience, so I'm going to settle for increased levels of immigration. 
We've got to let in more immigrants. And then they give a beautiful talk about how immigrants have contributed to America's heritage and how they produce prosperity. And then they conclude their talk with, and so therefore, let's call for more immigration. And the people in the audience, they just love it and they applaud, mostly conservatives. And because you see, in their mind, we're advancing liberty here. We're advancing freedom by calling for more immigrants. They're not advancing freedom one iota. Not one single bit when they're doing that. Why? Because they're conveying the message to people that government has a legitimate role in controlling the immigration and therefore they're pleading with government to let in more immigrants. So it's not threatening to anybody. You know, conservatives, change is threatening to conservatives. You know, they want to conserve. I mean, if you have a free society, conservatives are great because they'll conserve whatever they happen to be living under. But when you've got an unfree society, conservatives are a disaster because they want to conserve the status quo. But conservatives sit there and say, yeah, I favor more immigrants. I'm advancing freedom. This is free market oriented. What a great proposal. But it assumes that government has a legitimate role and we're pleading with government to let in more immigrants. Notice also that the case for, for open immigration is much more difficult to make than it is to say more immigrants should be let in. That's not too controversial, you know. Oh, more immigrants? Oh, okay. But making the case for open borders is much more difficult. You've got to start talking about fundamental rights and the right of people to pursue happiness and the benefits that come from free movements just like we have here domestically in the United States. Open borders between the 50 states. Didn't have to be that way. We have the greatest free trade and free movement zone in history. And this is one of the distinguishing characteristics of libertarians. It's one of the, it's one of the positions that makes me most proud to be a, a, a libertarian, is our position on open borders and free movements of people. And to stop this massive suffering, not to mention all the horrendous uh, violations of civil liberties have come with immigration controls, including these, these inspection stations that they have set up on the highways of America where you don't even have to leave the country and have to sh go in there and show your papers. And of course, if you're a white Anglo, you got no problem. You can just say, yeah, I'm an American citizen. But if you're a dark-skinned Hispanic living on the border, heaven help you if you don't have your papers with you. Just like in totalitarian regimes. And they are part and parcel of immigration controls. With one comes the other. Uh, education, another classic example here of, 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 uh, of uh, reform versus dismantling. I mean, there's only one real solution to the educational morass, and that's separate school and state, just like we separated church and state. End all government involvement in education, compulsory attendance laws, school taxes, school buildings, school teachers, everything. Turn everything over to the free market. And yet, what do conservatives say, and many libertarians, vouchers. Got to have vouchers. Now, no, notice the problem here. Now, the, the, some of them, like Fried, Milton Friedman many years ago said, oh, well, th this is really just a gradualist way to get to the goal line, which is no state involvement. And I questioned that 25 years ago. And, but I questioned it on moral grounds. I said, because in the period of the gradualism, no, notice what you're doing with vouchers. You're stealing. You're taking money from people to whom it belongs and you're giving it to people to whom it doesn't belong. So here you have the phenomenon of libertarians standing for a moral principle, don't take what doesn't belong to you, and advocating as part of their educational program a system that takes money from a person to whom it belongs and giving it to a person to whom it does not belong. How can anybody have respect for a philosophy that calls for violating its own principles as a way to getting to its goal line of not violating its principles? But what I didn't question 25 years ago was the idea that it was gradual, that it was really gradualism. And I, I was serving on the Libertarian Party platform committee and the debate came up and I opposed the gradualist methods in the platform on that basis that you're violating moral principles during the term of the gradualism. But it never occurred to me to question the assumption that this really is a gradualist method to get there. And over 25 years I finally realized it's not. It's just another status program. Now, it's built under libertarianism, it's built under free market, under choice, but it doesn't make any difference how it's built. It's just another status program. It runs in competition. And even worse, nowadays, you have people that are saying, 
not that it's not a gradualist way to get rid of public schooling, but that it will improve the public schooling system. That's, that's her sales pitch. And then, like in Milwaukee, they've had that for 25 years, vouchers in Milwaukee. And do you see any of the voucher proponents saying, well, gradualism time is up, people. <laughs> 25 years is enough time for gradualism. No. And, and so if you're going to be buying these, these anti-freedom libertarian proposals, be prepared that they're going to last at least 25 years. Uh, the drug war. The drug war is an interesting phenomenon because you have groups that are in, truly involved in reform. And I would say that the, some of these reforms are very valuable. I mean, like, they're, they're opposing mandatory minimum sentences and they try to get this thing resolved and, and lowered and eliminated. Great stuff. And you've got uh, people trying to um, get rid of asset forfeiture laws, you know, which is really just highway robbery where their cops are stealing from people on the highways and stuff. And, and great stuff. But, but make no mistake about it. This is not freedom. And we never should, uh, you know, even think that it's freedom. It's sort of like reforming those plantations in the, in the, in the 19th century. Making life better for the serfs, no question about it, but it's not freedom. Freedom entails the right to, to ingest whatever you want to ingest without fear of being punished in some way by the state. And so those people that, like, they call for marijuana legalization because marijuana is not too harmful, okay, you want to make that argument? To me, it's not a very powerful argument because it leaves the implication with the person that if it is harmful, then maybe it's okay for the state to be controlling it. My argument is, I don't care if it's heroin, LSD, whatever. Freedom entails sitting in the privacy of your own home and doing whatever you want to do as long as your conduct is peaceful. I don't care how dangerous or self-destructive it is. Now, that's the welfare state, okay? The whole idea of the government should exist to take care of us, to watch over us. But as, as horrific as it, it is, it, as it is, it pales to insignificance with respect to the warfare state or what we call the national security state. And, and here is the great distinguishing characteristic of, of libertarians and conservatives, and liberals too. I mean, they, they, they love the warfare state too. But, you, you know, and I saw this after 9-11. You know, we, I always suspected there was a big split in the libertarian movement on this issue. But 9-11, that drew the line. And all the interventionists and the empire libertarians rose to the surface. And I remember it was a week after 9-11, I was attending a big libertarian dinner and we were out in the parking lot, uh, I mean, waiting for our cars to come uh, in front of the hotel in Washington. And one libertarian says to me, you libertarians are finally going to see what, what or, or, no, he says, we libertarians are finally, or no, no, he says, we Americans are finally going to see what Latin America had to deal with, with terrorism. And I said, oh. And of course, what came to my mind was what Pinochet had done, you know, who was a conservative darling. In, in, in Chile, he still is a conservative darling, where he had, you know, killed uh, 3,000 people, where they had rounded up 40, 50,000 innocent people. I mean, people who, whose cry, only crime was believing in the wrong philosophy, communism, and he raped them, and he tortured them, and he abused them, and, and executed, like I say, 3,000 of them. And, I'm, and then they had Operation Condor, where the CIA was actively involved as a partner, where they killed tens of thousands of people for believing in communism. And, hey, I'm a libertarian. I'm as anti-communist as, as the next guy, if not more so. But to kill somebody because he believes in a, in a wrong philosophy? I don't think so. And, and yet, so when this guy says, oh, we're going to see what we're going to do, and he was right, because all of a sudden we now live under a government that, is, that is, has the power to round up Americans, to torture Americans, to assassinate Americans, and it's exercising that power. It's already assassinated some Americans, and it has the power to do so all across the world, including here in the United States. I mean, all you need is the right crisis, and man, the floodgates of tyranny come up. Come, you know, flying open. And, and so throughout the 9-11, post-9-11 period, there's been this libertarian wing. They, they call them the, the liberventionists that have, that have favored this empire, massive standing army, CIA, NSA. Some libertarians say, oh, I just don't see what the big beef is about that the government's monitoring my email. I mean, I'm not doing anything wrong, so what's, what's wrong with, with the government watching over everything I do? Well, yeah, why not put a camera in every room in every person's house, too? Uh, and, and so, 
but here was the dividing line and, and the libertarians that stood against this. I mean, that was their shining moment of, of standing against this, this massive totalitarian structure. Now, there's some libertarians that call for reform. Got to rein in the Pentagon. 10% cut in government spending on the military. Uh, rein in the CIA. All this reform, reform, reform. Or, you know, on, on foreign interventionism, let's be more selective on foreign intervention. Which countries we intervene in? One of my favorite tests is, let's just do it when it's in our interests. It's like, what? I mean, what does that mean, in our interests? And who makes that decision? Well, clearly it's the government that makes the decision. I guarantee you that every one of their interventions, Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, uh, Grenada, Chile, Cuba, every one of them, they believe that the intervention was proper. Vietnam. And so, you know, one solution is, okay, stop the foreign interventionism. But it's not enough. you got to go to the root of the problem, and that's the whole totalitarian structure known as the national security state. The standing army. Read what the founding fathers said about standing armies. They are the greatest threat to our freedom. And, and the CIA, this is a totalitarian structure. It's inherent to every totalitarian regime. NSA, CIA, standing armies. We don't need it. You can dismantle the whole thing because that is the root of the threat to our freedoms. And conservatives and even some libertarians say, oh my God, they're shocked. I mean, because they're, they're inculcated with this notion of defense, defense. So we've got to you know, have massive bases all over the world and here in the United States for defense. Defense against what? I mean, defense against the terrorists that their policies are producing? So that threat disappears. Okay, well, where is the threat of an invasion of the United States? Who's going to invade the United States? Who has the, the, the money to do that? Who has the manpower, the hundreds of thousands of ships, the millions of troops? The, the air trans, the, the, the transport planes to bring all, you know, three million, five million troops it would be necessary to carry out a successful invasion of the United States. It doesn't exist. There is no threat against this country. None. Except the only threat that exists are the threats that their foreign policies produce in the form of, of terrorism. And then they use those threats to take away our freedoms. That's what the NSA is about. And that's what the power to round us up and torture us and so forth. That's what that's all about. So you dismantle this thing. Now you may think, well, people will be shocked if they hear these ideas. Yeah? But the only way for people to achieve the same breakthrough that you have achieved and that I've achieved, because I, wasn't all, I didn't always know about libertarianism, I discovered it. And the only way I discovered it was I happened to read about it. And it didn't take immediately. I remember a friend gave me back in the 70s a little book called A Time for Truth by a man named William Simon, who was serving as, I think, Treasury, uh, head of the Treasury under Reagan. And he talked about the Soviet Union and the United States and how we, were, we had lost our freedoms here in America. And, and I remember re going back to my friend who recommended the book to me, and I said, this, this guy's like a little crazy. I mean, he's, he's, asking, he's, he's suggesting that Americans are not free. That's ridiculous. What's he, what's he saying here? And, but it planted a seed. And a few years later, I discovered libertarianism, and I broke through, and I realized what he was talking about. But the only way that's going to happen is by planting that idea, not, not fearing to tell people the truth on Social Security and Medicare. Because when you show the conviction that, that freedom works, that conveys a powerful message. If you're scared of, of, of having a free society, why should li non-libertarians be any more enthusiastic about it. So I subscribe to what I call the critical mass theory of, of achieving freedom. That when we reach a critical mass of people who are libertarians, who want a free society, right now, and my, my hunch is that we may be very close to that phenomenon. I mean, we've been working in this field for many, many decades, and there's a lot of libertarians in the, in the world now. It's really incredible. And my hunch is that when you reach a critical mass, which can be very fewer than a majority, like maybe just 10% of a population, maybe less, you reach that critical mass, and all of a sudden, everything suddenly shifts, like the Berlin Wall shifted. And I, my hunch is that we're close to that. But the only way to keep getting our numbers into the libertarian movement is by hewing to principle. If we stick with our principles, I think we have a 
an opportunity to not only lead America to the greatest and the freest society in history, we have an opportunity to lead the world. Thank you very much. All right, thank, thank you very much. Uh, Q&A, we've got 10 minutes. Morning, Jacob. Hey. Uh, in regards to a critical mass, could you be any more specific on what, you know, what demographic that may be? Is there a certain class uh, or a certain type, a personality type or what have you that, um, you know, that if targeted might speed this process along? Yeah. Uh, I think it's, it's more a matter of people who are naturally disposed to libertarianism. I mean, libertarians come from all walks of life. That's what I've learned. I mean, wealthy, poor, uh, doctors, lawyers, uh, uh, janitors. I mean, there's, I don't think there's any real demographic. There's something that just makes us libertarians. I, uh, I've almost concluded that it's like in our DNA that, that there's some of us that are libertarians, and you can't convert people. I mean, I, I have family members that are not libertarians. Uh, they, they love me dearly, but nothing I have done has influenced their thinking. They're conservative to the core. And so I've come to the conclusion that Frank, Frank Shodorov, there, there was a great libertarian named Frank Shodorov in the 50s. And, and Shodorov says, our job is not to make libertarians or individualists, as he called them. Our job is to find them. And I really think that's what we need to be doing. But how do you find them? Well, I say you do that through the power of the message. And we just, we believe at, at the Future of Freedom Foundation, just getting out this message into the marketplace. Because if you do a survey of people that discover libertarianism, most of them are discovered inadvertently. You know, like they'll find a book or they'll see a pamphlet or they'll hear somebody. It's very rarely, oh, somebody converted me. Now, if you look at corporations, they usually have, uh, that they want to shift philosophy, and there's a guy named W. Edwards Deming that has done, he's like the guru of management. And, and, and Deming said that when you want to change the philosophy of a firm, it starts out with a tiny minority of people. And, and, and that tiny minority starts to grow and grow, and more people say, hey, that's a good idea, and they start learning about it. And then one day it just shifts, the whole philosophy of the firm. And it's only like 5%. Or 6%. And if you look at great movements in history, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, habeas corpus, uh, Magna Carta, whatever, it's always a tiny, tiny minority of people that are committed, passionate about freedom. And then things shift. So I don't think there's anything like real scientific about answering your question. It's more like just keep working because you don't know how close you are to reaching that critical mass. There's no way to measure it. I have to take this opportunity to fanboy for a second. Way back when C-SPAN was still new, I saw you in a debate talking about the dime's worth of difference between the, Republic, the Democrats and the Republicans, and that has always stuck with me, so thank you for that. Oh, wow, thank you. So on the subject of critical mass, all of us who moved to New Hampshire as part of the Free State Project, and I having been here nearly more than 10 years now and seeing the incredible changes that happen when we now have a couple of dozen hardcore libertarians and even some anarchists in our government. When is your expected moving date, sir? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, as a guy that grew up in Laredo, Texas, when global warming heats things up hot enough where New Hampshire becomes like Texas, you'll see me moving. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi, Jacob. As I, uh, I think I've told you before, but maybe not everyone else uh, uh, knows, but I, I really credit you with uh, bringing me to libertarianism when I was a high school student uh, wow. back in uh, Houston, Texas. Uh, but um, I remember we had a phone conversation about uh, drug legalization, and you kind of persuaded me by the end of the call that this was a, a good idea. But uh, What's uh, your name? Uh, Jason Sorens. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I hate to give you the bad news, man, but you're, you're aging. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's starting to happen. Um, anyway, my, uh, my question is, you know, we, 
we're looking to get a critical mass here, but um, you know, there's also a, a sort of a critical mass on the other side, right? There's a, a status critical mass among the interest groups that sort of feed off the state. Do you have ideas about uh, strategies to kind of weaken the opposition so that, you know, that they don't have the influence on politicians that they have now? How can we loosen that kind of death grip over, over politics at teachers' unions and uh, the you know, prison guards and, and all these other interest groups that, that benefit from big government? Yeah, that's a fascinating question on methodology. Uh, the guy that had the big influence on me was Leonard Reed, who is the founder of an organization called the Foundation for Economic Education that I know many of you are familiar with. They, they publish a great little magazine called The Freeman. And he had this bell chart when I discovered in my 20s where it, it's like over here in this sector are the hard, pure, committed libertarians, and over here are the statists, the, the same counterparts that want, you know, government involvement in our lives. And in here are the, the people, most of the people that don't really care one way or the other. And you can see that in life. You know, when you encounter people out in life, and you say, I'm a libertarian, you know, they don't care. And, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. And that what you're really trying to do, Reed says, is find enough of them from the middle into your little sector over here where everything then shifts. Now your question is, how do you get this over here more influential, more persuasive to get that critical mass that overwhelms this little tiny minority? And I, I think that it really comes from the ability to make the, the persuasive case for libertarianism whenever the opportunity arises. And, and don't fear doing that. Um, there's an old saying that nothing worse can befall a good cause than to have it ineptly defended. <laughs> and, and, and we see that as, you know, libertarians sometimes. Sometimes we, you know, we're, we're our worst enemies. And I, I fall into that trap sometimes, you know, where it's fun to bash a statist, you know. But, um, but it, if we do that, like, like the other day I was, I was playing bridge with a guy, and he, he said something about Rand Paul just made a great proposal. They know I'm a libertarian. Rand Paul just came out with that great proposal of a flat tax. Okay, well, there, there was my opportunity. I could have said, yeah, isn't that great? But I said, oh, no, I'm not going to let that go. And, and I just said, oh, yeah, it's nice, but it's a little weak. And he says, what do you mean? And I said, well, there should be no income tax at all. And he says, that's ridiculous. And I said, do you know that America lived without an income tax for 125 years? And I said, people have a right to keep everything they earn. And that was it. That was the end of the conversation. But that's the only way. I don't know what happens to him, but you have to be willing to just drop your seeds and then not worry about the outcome. Just keep making the case in whatever way you can make it whenever life presents you those opportunities. Letters to the editor, op-eds, conversations, staying in line, talking to people. And don't worry that it's only one or two people because it starts mounting up. When you've got hundreds of thousands of libertarians all doing that same thing, there's this rippling out effect. And don't worry about the outcome. There's a, there's a great quote by George Washington where he says, let's just repair to this standard and let the outcome is in the hands of God. Don't worry about what the outcome is. Worry about how to advance liberty in your own circles. And that's what I would say. That's how we're going to achieve it. Yeah. yeah. Hi, Jacob. You may have actually answered this just by that answer. But uh, you're talking about the difference between ethical libertarianism and utilitarian libertarianism, you know, to put it in my parlance, where... There's a lot of libertarians who are uh, you know, either Cato or Reason. They're talking about, well, we get a better outcome by decreasing the state. And you're actually coming from a, a, a non-aggression -aggress type of perspective. Can you talk a little bit about the battle within the libertarians uh, between those two, two perspectives? Yeah, I mean, what I'm really trying to do, I really would like to see the free society before I pass from this life. And, and I think it's a possibility. And I, when I saw all those people in the Ron Paul campaign pop up and support him, it was like, oh my gosh. I mean, I was shocked. Uh, I mean, I, okay, to put things in perspective, uh, in, when I discovered libertarianism, I was in Laredo, Texas, and, and I called Houston, the Houston uh, Libertarian Party, the headquarters of the Texas Libertarian Party, Woman answers the phone. She says, my name is Honey Lanham. She was state chairman. She was handling the distribution of the materials. I said, can you please send me some materials down to here in Laredo? And she said, sure. So about 20 years later, I, I ran into her and I said, uh, I was at an LP convention and I was sitting next to her and I said, Honey, 
do you perchance remember me calling you and asking for materials? And she said, how could I forget you were the only libertarian in a city of 100,000 people? So, okay. So, so all of a sudden, you know, this is a big movement. I saw all these people with Ron Paul pop up. Okay, they may not all be purist libertarians, but they're identifying as libertarians. They're supporting his philosophy and his ideas. And I'm thinking, my gosh, we really do have a chance to achieve this, this, this free society in my lifetime. So what I'm trying to do with these other libertarian organizations is nudging them and pushing them and giving up these reform plans and let's go for the free society. Now, when we talk about utilitarianism, they'll say, oh, well, Jacob, your approach isn't very practical. My, I, on the contrary, to me, it's the only practical approach. It's the only thing that works. I mean, to me, utilitarian is what works. Open borders work. They're the only solution to all these immigration crises. Uh, the repeal of the whole welfare state works, freedom works. If we settle for these reform things or these libertarian-oriented choice, privatization, vouchers, medical IRAs, and stuff, what we're communicating to people is that freedom doesn't work, that we have to do things slowly and, 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 and we have to accept the, the, the premises of the welfare state. And, and I'm here saying, no, we don't because freedom works and we have to communicate that to people. I have no doubts that if Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid were repealed today, today, there would not be a problem, okay? People, people adjust very quickly, including seniors, including their children, including private charitable groups, people adjust very quickly. But if you don't believe in freedom, if you don't think it's gonna work and you communicate that to people, what are the chances that a non-libertarian is going to say, oh, yeah, I'm going to go for the big free society when all those libertarians won't? I don't think so. So we have to stand for the philosophy. And so some of these organizations that, that call for these reform measures, yeah, I'm trying to nudge them into saying, hey, let's give up the vouchers and the, all those other stuff and let's go for it all because we have the opportunity. We can prevail. We don't have to... Think about the future in 40 years from now and all that stuff. We can achieve the free society in our lifetime. And one final thing about this. Remember that in like 1890 America, and, and I'm not saying it was a libertarian paradise. Don't start sending me the letters saying, oh, you think the 19th century was a libertarian paradise. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is here was a society with no income tax, federal reserve, public schooling, income tax, um, uh, drug war, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, gun control, none of that. And, and yet, think what the statists must have believed. I mean, you talk about being depressed about your prospects for statism. They had to be very depressed. And yet they kept fighting, and within 30 or 40 years, they had achieved their welfare state and warfare state revolution. Why can't we do things in reverse? I mean, you, you know, we, we, we have a big base to build on, and I think we can achieve that. Okay, one last question. Hi, Kirsten Tynan from the Fully Informed Jury Association. It's so nice to hear Honey, Honey's name. Uh, that's not usually the context we hear it in. Um, just quickly, this morning I was looking at a map of data of which states have the most libertarians per capita, and it occurred to me to compare that to the Freedom in the 50 States Index, which states uh, have the most freedom. And there's not very good correlation among the top five. Um, what are your thoughts on using data to... Um, uh, develop strategy and tactics and things and, and do you have any thoughts on how those, those uh, correlations might not match up, like what the reasons for that would be? Uh, yeah, first of all, let me say uh, I tip my hat to Fiji. I mean, you guys have been just one of my Thank heroes you. in this movement. I mean, just, uh, you know, in fact, um, Larry Dodge, who founded it, was a really good friend of mine and um, yeah, I've written some stuff on jury nullification just recently, and it's... It, I saw your video. It was very good. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, it's just, it's, it's an awesome organization and movement that you guys, and very courageous, by the way. You guys take a lot of flack from the, 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 the establishment, and I love it. Every time I see you guys getting arrested for handing out brochures, I'm thinking, they're not going to get very far with that prosecution, and it just embarrasses them, so... Yeah, your point, question about data is very fascinating. You know, I, I am not aware of what's going on in there at all. I, I certainly think it's got to be constructive because I know there's statisticians that do those, that type of thing. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 I would say, you know, let, let a thousand flowers bloom in that area. In terms of advancing liberty, 
I don't think there's a real surefire formula. So, I mean, we're all like competing and trying to figure out. I'm just saying that whatever formula you're using to do that, stick with the principles. That don't abandon the principles because people listen to principles. They respond to principles. Nobody's ever gone to the barricades in history for the sake of a cost-benefit analysis. Okay? Uh, they go because of liberty, because of morals, because of right values. That's what distinguishes libertarians. And then if you can use those principles in the context of what you're talking about, the real world ana analysis. How can we achieve freedom in New Hampshire? How do we get more people here? How do we not only get libertarians into office, but how can we push the, liber the, the Democrats and the Republicans, uh, in other words, the status party, into a libertarian movement? And, and finally, I'll just wrap this up by look what we've accomplished in the drug war. I mean, 25 years ago, you, if I call for drug legalization on a phone uh, a talk show, all the lines would light up, you know, attacking me. Today, drug legalization is on the table. It's being debated. It's being advanced by judges, prosecutors, cops. I mean, I said many years ago, the first thing that's going to go in the, in the welfare state is the drug war, and I still believe that. That's the power of ideas. And within that context, if you can figure out ways to get drug legalization in the states, I say more power to you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.